Hi, everyone. Uh, in unit one, we talked a bit about argument structure when I was talking about essay structure. I did talk about uh, the kind of classical argument structure that goes back to uh, ancient Greece um, uh, and uh, oratorical arguments. Um, the, the stuff that the five paragraph essay is kind of uh, derived from that, that structure of having an argument that, that sets up a thesis uh, and, and then uh, lays out your points uh, and then develops each point before reaching that conclusion. Um, this time in unit two, I want to get more into the theory behind argument or rhetoric, as they would call it. Uh, back then, and it's still, uh, you know, well, some some terms that were used in ancient Greece uh, by Aristotle, they're going to come up as well, uh, and we're go we're going to uh, uh, some of them you may have heard before, so this this may not be um, that new to you, but but it's something that's important to understand uh, when whenever you make a persuasive claim, whenever you're making an argument in an essay. It's important for you to think about some of the things I'm going to talk about in this essay and in another one. Um, this, let me share my screen with you. I have a little presentation here. Uh, argumentation, appeals, and logical fallacy. So I, I want to talk about rhetorical appeals with you first. Uh, rhetorical appeals uh, has to do with how you are appealing to your audience. If you are trying to persuade your audience, your readers in, in an essay, uh, then you need to think about why they're going to be persuaded, why they, uh, why they will find your argument convincing, uh, and how you're going to appeal to them. So that's what we'll talk about first. Logical fallacies is going to be another video uh, a little bit later in this unit. So um, a lot of times, first of all, we see arguments everywhere. Arguments are not just in essays. Arguments can be, you'll see arguments being made um, when you are watching television uh, in advertisements. Those are, it's very common to see arguments being made in, uh, in, in uh, advertisements. Um, in fiction, you read fiction or you watch a TV series, if there seems to be some underlying message that you're supposed to be taking from it, then uh, then there is an argument that's being made. Maybe they have the characters in a TV show you like um, struggling with some uh, some some social issue, right? Um, uh, whether or not something is right or the characters learn a lesson in this show. Uh, it may be that the writers of the show are trying to convince you that you should also take the same, same lesson that the characters are, are taking. Um, and this would be when you have an argument that's made where you're not stating outright what you want the reader to think, what you want, how you want the reader to be persuaded, right? You're not stating your thesis and here are your reasons. Then it's more of an implicit argument. And uh, this, is, this is pretty common in most things. Explicit means it's right out there for everyone to see. You're you're not you're not really being subtle about what you're arguing. Uh, you're being overt is another term. You might you're just speaking plainly, right? You're being very clear about what you're arguing. So in academic argument, you're not typically being you're not typically making an implicit argument. You are making an explicit argument. You are being very clear about what you're arguing. You are stating your argument clearly in a thesis and stating your reasons and giving your evidence. You're not being coy. You're not uh, you know, playing with the reader, making them wonder what you want them to think, making them wonder what your position is. Um, that's common when you look at art, when you look at like a, a, a painting or a, a piece of fiction or something like that. Often in art, uh, the artist isn't so clear about what they're trying to uh, say. You know, they, they might make their artwork 
interpretable in more than one way. You know, you might take the work of art this way and think this, or you might take it another way and have a completely different interpretation. Their argument would be more implicit, which means it's implied. Um, it's maybe the argument is just suggested if you interpret it in such a way. So here's some advertisements that have some implicit arguments. Some are more explicit than others, but I would ask you to uh, we we'll look at these. Um, you know, each time pause the video and ask yourself what's the argument being made here. So go ahead and pause it and think about what is being said by this advertisement. So I would look at this and I would say, for those of you who have never seen an old fashioned television, this is a television with dials in her eye. This is like a baby's head, right? Uh, it says, she's got your eyes. Now we, ca we commonly say she's got your eyes about a baby because the baby is taking after the parents, right? Some sort of genetic, uh, you know, resemblance or something like that. Well, if she's got your eyes and the baby's eyes are television screens, what is this saying? Maybe the argument they're making is that you're letting your baby watch too much TV. It's an argument about screen time. Or the baby's watching too much TV because you watch too much TV. And so the it's really, uh, you need to be a better role model for your baby and not watch so much television, not, not just sit in front of the TV all day because then your baby is also sitting in front of the TV all day. So you can see there's, there's a, a, a more complex argument being made here, but it's not being stated outright. Some of these are kind of uh, troubling, you know. Feel free to fast forward through the video uh, if, if you find any of these two. Um, troubling. I will say that this isn't a real photo of a, an injured child. Uh, and, and you can tell that from the posing with the thumbs up throughout the, the uh, picture. It was, uh, it was, it's posed um, photograph. Okay, so um, I sometimes have students who guess this one. Uh, it says, be a volunteer, change a life, right? Um, crisis relief organization. That might help you figure it out. But really, the thumbs up is what gives it away for a lot of people because they think of thumbs up as being the like button on Facebook. And that is really what this is saying. Liking isn't helping. It's the idea that like um, uh, when something terrible happens, just saying thoughts and prayers doesn't do anything to help. Um, and actually, as this is saying, volunteering, um, actually giving of your time or money donation, right? Some sort of uh, concrete support for uh, refugees or, or victims of violence in other countries or victims of natural disasters, things like that. Um, too many people get the feeling of uh, you know, self-satisfaction like they helped because they liked something. Okay, so look at this one. So obviously he's driving, but he's on the phone and he's distracted. He's looking at this map. She's also distracted uh, looking at him, map in front of her face. And there's a kid. Oh, it looks like that kid's about to get hit by the car. But there's something going on interesting here. This is a baby in the back seat, right? Or a toddler in the back seat. And the toddler's face is superimposed on the face of the, the kid who's about to be hit by the car. Could they be saying with that? I'll give you, it says, think of both sides. <clears throat> think of both sides would be the side of the kid outside the car is about to get hit, but also think about the kid in the back seat. Well, how is this going to bother the kid in the back seat? Um, it may be more than one way that you could take this, uh, that you could think that the the child, the children you're endangering by driving without, you know, paying attention by by being on your phone while you drive, uh, that that child is someone else's child, right? Like you have a child. Could you imagine if that was your child being out there and and getting being in danger? Um, or it could also be that this child is learning 
bad habits from the parents, right? That they're being bad role models. I, I, I think the former, the first uh, interpretation is probably more accurate because I don't think toddlers are usually paying that much attention to how their parents drive and those habits until they're older. It says the number of car accidents involving children increases during school holidays. Please be extremely careful. Okay. Now you might start to see a pattern in these arguments. They have to do often with here, we see children, right? Children. Children. Child. An innocent child. Is this child being harmed? An innocent child. Is this child facing injustice? An innocent child. Are we doing what we can to help the child? An innocent child. Are you being irresponsible and, and causing harm to the next generation? Now we have this. Not about a child. But about an innocent, if you're looking at an animal. Now, what is this saying? Um, the, the clock, the time is running out, right? And this is saying every 60 seconds a species dies out. So this is, this is about um, conserving uh, endangered species, right? Uh, and it's suggesting that time is running out. Here, uh, this is, uh, you can see here, innocence and danger might give you an idea of what this is about. Uh, so this is meant to be um, a child or a teen, maybe a, a preteen or a teenager. Uh, but there's a, looks like a hand here. It says here, sexual predators can hide in your child's smartphone. Uh, so again, back to a child being in danger. How does this make people feel. Uh, now this one obviously is, uh, is not about a child, so it's kind of hard to tell how old she is, but it is making a definite argument here about harm being done to people. What is this saying? This looks like a drawing from like a fashion designer. And this, the proportions are all pretty similar, but she is not the ideal of beauty that you might think of because you look at her and you think, oh, she's very unhealthy. This woman is looks starved to death or uh, that she like she suffers from uh, anorexia or uh, bulimia, something like that. Um, and that's really the point of this argument. It says you are not a sketch, say no to anorexia. Uh, really what it's saying is, is that the fashion industry and media may portray an ideal of beauty that's unrealistic because if this is what you're saying women should look like, this is what they would look like in real life. And so it's encouraging things like anorexia, which we know anorexia and bulimia are often made worse by uh, people looking at, at media images and, 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 and having sort of body, body dys, dysmorphia. I don't know if that's the right word, dysphoria or dysmorphia. Uh, where, you know, they might be very trim and thin and healthy, but they feel like they're fat because they look at images of uh, what they think they should look like. So uh, <clears throat> the argument is there. Here we go. Again, a child. What is this saying? As soon as this eye closes, right, this car hits them. So what is that saying? Well, it says... I didn't cover this up very well. Don't drive sleepy project. Sleepiness is stronger than you. I've had uh, students who say, oh, well, that's clearly about driving drunk or driving high. I guess the, the uh, you know, that, they say that before they see the sleepiness thing. But I guess that's um, possible. I, it's basically the same, the same, uh, the same meaning, right? Um, if you are irresponsible enough to drive when you are not alert, whether because you're sleepy or, or drunk or, or whatnot, then yeah, you could hit this person. Not just this person, this kid. See, a lot of these appeal to you because of a child who might be in danger or suffering or um, something unfair is happening to them. This next one is not about a child. It's about everybody, right? You may notice 
these forests are the shape of lungs. It says before it's too late. This is like about deforestation uh, and our ability to breathe. But I want to go back to this one because <clears throat> I want to talk about how it's appealing. That's, that's what I'm talking about here is arguments use certain appeals to really uh, make the readers in, an, in a, a written piece or the audience, it gets the audience on your side. It makes the audience feel like, oh, like they know what they're talking about and they're right because they put it in this certain way, right? That's what an appeal is in an argument. Um, if it was just this guy in a suit, would, you, would this be as effective? I don't think it would be. Maybe you think, well, why is that guy in the road or something like that? But because there's a child, you are almost automatically, almost instinctively, you, we have this kind of instinctive thing that children need to be protected. And so we're, we're kind of on, that, on the side of the person who's arguing that children need to be protected. Also, there's a moral component here. If you're suggesting that children need to be protected, of course, you're going to be on the side of right because uh, arguing that no, children don't need to be protected often looks like you lack some sort of ethics in your argument. Uh, and that's what I want to get into with argument is uh, things about uh, emotional impact of an argument and uh, ethical components of an argument. Now, when I say argument, I don't mean like a fight. A lot of people hear the term argument and they think, you know, like, uh, I just heard my neighbors this morning. I got woken up very early because they were uh, yelling. It was like a domestic dispute, right? I, that's not what I mean by an argument. When people get into a fight, like a quarrel, they're not thinking logically. They're not really listening to the other person and they're not really laying out their, their side of an argument with any sort of logic or reason, right? And that's what we're talking about when we talk about an academic argument, we're talking about giving reasons and evidence to support a point of view. Think of it more like a lawyer, right? A lawyer lays out the evidence, interprets it for the jury. They're trying to persuade the jury to believe them or the judge, right? They're trying, the, the other lawyer does the same thing. They're trying to persuade them to interpret the evidence in a certain way, right? So that they find for, for their client, for the defendant or, or uh, you know, for the, the, the prosecution. Um, so an argue, think of the argument more like you are a lawyer trying to persuade your readers to agree with your side. Right, so you're making a point about a subject, uh, and you're supporting it with evidence. And it hurts your argument if you are seen as being unfair, if it seems like you're misleading, right? If if you're if you're saying things that aren't true, the jury's going to see through it, and they're not going to believe you. If you seem like you're just trying to manipulate the jury, uh, and you don't have a lot of evidence on your side, but you're just trying to make them. Uh, feel bad or something like that, then maybe they're not going to go with you. They're going to go with the person that has more evidence on their side. If it seems like uh, you are presenting false evidence, anything like that, you need to be fair. Also, it's about having proper etiquette. Uh, when you make an argument, you don't want to seem like you are uh, personally attacking or being unfair to the other side. You don't see lawyers uh, calling the other, calling, you know, the prosecution, you don't see them uh, uh, using name calling or something like that, or, or the lawyers calling each other names and, and uh, things like that throughout an argument. It's all very proper and it's a formal situation, right? Think of it that way when you're writing your argument. <clears throat> now, there are different ways that uh, lawyers might appeal to, uh, to the jury, the same way that there are different ways that anyone making an argument might appeal to their audience, the, the people they're trying to convince. I just mentioned it, a couple of them. Well, I mentioned all of them. I mentioned the lawyers referring to evidence, right? Evidence is one of them. I mentioned um, the way those advertisements affect you emotionally because they use kids in them. Em emotions is another one.
I mentioned how it might seem like you're uh, in a position of ethical, uh, like your argument has has some ethics behind it because you're arguing for protecting kids and that's the right thing to do. Ethics is the third one. So you may have heard of these. There, there are some uh, let's see types of evidence here, but we call them appeals, rhetorical appeals. This is how you appeal to your audience. Now, um, you may have heard of some of the old ancient, the, the old Greek terms for these. Uh, logic is called logos. Um, ethics is called uh, uh, ethos or ethos. Uh, and then emotions is the only one that sounds a little bit different. It's, it's uh, pathos. Um, we get a lot of different words from, from, the, from the word pathos. Uh, like, for example, sympathetic, right? And even pathetic. Like uh, when my daughter looks really sad because she really wants a cookie, uh, the correct way to use that term is to say that she is pathetic. It's like she is full of emotion. It's also that she is uh, trying to inspire emotion in other people and make them sympathetic or empathetic um, so that you feel bad for them. And that's what uh, appealing through emotion is a lot of time is about sympathy, right? Feeling bad for someone. Okay, so let's look at some of these appeals. An argument can be supported by logos or logic. This is the evidence that I'm talking about. Ooh, my alarm. Uh, the evidence, you know, the lawyer refers to evidence. These are facts. Uh, these are the facts of the case. Exhibit A, exhibit B, right? Uh, in, in an argument that you might make, it could be referring to statistics. It could be uh, quoting from someone who knows what they're talking about. So this would be expert testimony. So if you're quoting from someone, uh, the only way it really works to convince people would be if you can show that the person you're quoting knows what he's talking about and can be trusted, right? So this gets into uh, your, your reputability, your, your reputation. Uh, this gets into the, uh, another one later, ethos, which I'm going to talk more about. Um, but it's very, this is why it's very important to introduce your sources. When you quote from a source, don't just quote it and cite it. You have to introduce your sources to your reader. Like I, like I mentioned before in unit one when I was talking about leading into quotations, that's your opportunity to sh convince your reader that this quotation is strong evidence of, of something, right? <clears throat> like I could say, uh, I could use a quote that you know, supports my argument that... Um, Brussels sprouts are gross or something like that. Uh, well, obviously, Brussels sprouts are gross because, because quote, uh, they are the most disgusting thing ever, end quote. Well, what does that prove? Who said that? Oh, it turns out I'm quoting my 12-year-old um, nephew. He's not an, of course, he thinks Brussels, sprout, Brussels sprouts are terrible. Uh, it, it's, it's not, that's not proof of anything, except for the, you know, you, it's, first of all, Quotations often are uh, not proof of anything. Even if someone has a personal experience, it can't be said to be proof of anything unless that's typical of most people's experience. But uh, second of all, you know, the only way that a, a quotation is, is really evidence is when you can show that uh, this person has a reputation, this person knows what they're talking about, like this person has, uh, is a PhD professor and such and such. This person is an author with recognized expertise, right? He's written books about this, et cetera. Then, then it goes to be a, a, stronger, a stronger piece of evidence. But otherwise, you're looking at facts and statistics that you can cite. That's how you build a logical argument. And there's, there's more than that for logic. There is things like uh, this is true, and then this is true. Therefore, this third thing must be true. There's, there's, there are ways to, to draw inferences uh, and, and reach conclusions based on facts that you've set up. Um, that's not something I'm going to be teaching so much in this class, except when I talk about um, logical fallacies in the next video, I will be talking about false logic, flaws in your logic. Okay, so another appeal would be pathos, the emotional appeal. 
most of the time, fear and sympathy are the big ones. That's how, like all of those ads that I showed you, they were referring, or they were appealing to, to you based on your, uh, your sympathy for those children, right? Or fear that like it could be fear for your own child when you think about a child being in danger. Um, fear and sympathy, fear and sympathy are the really common arguments. And you see these in social and political arguments all the time. Uh, take for example, the arguments on both sides about immigration. You see one side that wants, uh, immigration, stricter immigration policies and things like that. Um, that is, they'll say things like, that immigrants are dangerous. They'll, they'll claim that uh, the immigrants coming from other countries are criminals. They'll claim that they will, um, they're coming here to take your job away from you. Uh, you know, these are, these are common, you know, they'll, they'll claim that they're, they're all drug smugglers, things like that. Um, it's, it's a very, very common argument that's, that's being made uh, that, 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 uh, looser borders or or what what they'll often call open borders even though our borders aren't open um that they are allowing negative element criminals right our our president ran in his first campaign calling calling uh, uh immigrants rapists and uh uh you know he got a lot of flack for that obviously um what he what that is it it's it's essentially it's fear mongering right now look at the other side of the coin those who want uh more humane uh uh immigration policies uh usually the argument is made using sympathy sympathy for the immigrant who is a refugee coming from uh, uh fleeing from violence in their home country right uh, where if we send them back their lives could be at risk um, sympathy for families that are torn apart when ICE, you know, takes takes uh, parents away from their children and deports them. Sympathy for children who are separated from their families at the border and kept in in uh, you know in in cells and cages and things like that. So here you see uh, a lot of an arg argument on this issue. It comes down to, uh, oh, we should be afraid, is this side saying, and, and this side saying, no, we need to have sympathy for these people, right? So one thing that I will say is that relying too much on an emotional appeal in your argument can backfire on you. You shouldn't rely too much on it. You should rely on facts as well, right? Uh, statistics about, right? If you're going to make an argument about crime uh, and immigrants, do you have some statistics to back that up, right? Uh, things like that. If, if you're going to make an argument about um, uh, symp to sympathize with uh, families that are, that are being uh, uh, separated, maybe you have some uh, expert testimony that that is suggesting that um, that uh, separating them in is is uh, unnecessary or you know whatever it is that you're not just relying on emotional appeals because when you rely too much on emotional appeals sometimes your reader or the people the jury right that you're making the argument to they feel like you might be e manipulating their emotion and then this affects your last appeal, your last appeal, ethos, it's complicated. It's an ethical appeal, but really it has to do with you, the person making the argument, the lawyer, right? If, if, if it was the lawyer arguing to the jury, what does the jury think about that lawyer? Do they trust that lawyer, right? What do your readers think about you? Do they trust you? It's about your credibility. And it can be about your sense of right and wrong, your sense of what's fair and unfair, right? This is why having in a, uh, some sort of ethical uh, backbone to your argument is important. A good example of this is um, a famous, a famous satire by Jonathan Swift, the guy who wrote Gulliver's Travels. It's called The Modest Proposal. Uh, and in it, he talked about how England at the time that he wrote it, it was in the 1700s, I believe, 
Um, maybe I'm not not sure. Maybe the 1600s. I should know that. Um, <clears throat> he talks about how there are two major problems in in English society at the time that there are people going hungry, right? Poor are going hungry, and there are also uh, uh, orphan children just running around the streets without supervision, just like homeless children running around. And, and so he said, I have a logical solution to this problem. My logical solution is we take those orphan homeless children and we feed them to the poor people who are hungry. And then it solves both of our problems, right? The problem there is it's very logical. It does solve the problem, right? We won't have these orphan homeless children and the poor people will go hungry. But it's not ethical. There's a major ethical problem there. You're talking about cannibalism. You're talking about murder, right? And so, yeah, although you have logic on your side, no one's going to go for this because what you're proposing is monstrous and terrible. Uh, so it's, I mean, that's an extreme example, but no matter how logical and, and uh, full of uh, evidence your argument is, if it seems like you are not taking an ethical stance, if, if it seems like you are arguing for something that might be considered morally wrong or unfair, then it doesn't matter how, how, how logical your argument is. Uh, ethics is important. The ethics of the person making the argument, that they are in the right, right? That they are morally right in the argument that they are making. But then it's, because if they're not morally right, if they're, if, if, if they're, if they seem ethically wrong, then it affects their credibility. And that's really what ethos, the, 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 the ethics of the, the writer and the person making the argument is all about. Are they credible? Can you trust them? I can't trust this guy. He's arguing for us to eat children, right? Well, it's more about right and wrong though. It's not just about ethics. It's about credibility, right? Trustworthiness. Can you trust the person making the argument? There are lots of ways that you can lose the reader's trust in making your argument if you rely too much on emotional appeals without evidence. If the evidence you provide is uh, weak or you're presenting something as expert testimony, but you don't really you know, show that it's expert testimony, you don't introduce your sources uh, or your sources themselves aren't actually high quality sources or you're not citing them, right? These are all ways that you can lose credibility. Uh, <clears throat> there are, this is, this is how you kind of get the idea. It all kind of works together. They're all part of the pie. Uh, you, you don't just say, well, I have uh, uh, some statistics. You also maybe need to uh, show that your argument has a moral component to it. Uh, you also maybe need to appeal emotionally, but not too much, right? So all of these things work together. Uh, you might lose the trust of your audience in multiple ways and, and you need to you need to you need to be aware of that. There's a couple more um, actually I'm gonna go into these in the next the next video because this one is already getting long. So I'm going to, I'm going to start the next video when I talk about logical fallacies by giving some examples of uh, ways that uh, they might appeal, uh, that an advertisement, for example, would appeal to, to uh, an audience. And then some of them we're going to see are actually appealing falsely in an illogical way. And this will lead us into talking about a logical fallacies. So I want you to keep this stuff in mind, the appeals of the, uh, how you're appealing to the audience, always keep it in mind uh, as you're forming your argument.